you haven't been here before, I'm Ellen Chisa. I'm the founder and residence at Bolt Start. We organize this speaker series each week to help our mission of having technical founders become the world's best enterprise CEOs. And we often have other portfolio talent join us as well. I'm particularly excited for today because I have known Tammy from the product world for probably almost 10 years now. We share our best friend and she's done a ton of great roles. She was at Pivotal, she was at JustWorks, she was CPO and CEO of Cyrus Innovation, she was at Prod UX Labs, and now consults as a product leader coach. And she is a go-to person in our friend group for asking lots of product questions and particularly about customer insights. And so That's today- I have no problem expressing an opinion. It's true, you and I have that in common. We are both very direct, which is nice. Uh, and so today she is going to teach us all of the best ways to learn from our customers. If questions come up as we're going, you can drop them in the Q&A tool, you can drop them in a chat, and we'll try to get all of those answered as well. So thank you, Tammy. Welcome to the yeah. Pulse Right Speaker Series. And if you don't feel compo like compelled to type something, you can also raise your hand and say, I really want to talk, and Ellen can turn on your video, and we can have a conversation. The way we're going to run this today is that I'm going to talk for a little bit. You can chat or Q&A in between. I'm happy to be interrupted because uh, this is about your learning, not about me expressing my ideas. And so, and then we're going to have a long amount of time for Q&A after that. So um, hopefully you will learn something new, even if it's only one thing. Hopefully you'll learn half a dozen things new. Uh, and uh, let's get started. So today we're going to talk about maximizing customer insights. So customer insights are the things that you learn about your customer base that help you make better decisions, generally strategic decisions. Um, and only because this isn't my normal talk, I normally talk about product strategy. I want to emphasize that product strategy is not creating a plan. It's creating a framework of choices that drive other choices within the organization. And one of the best ways and to get inputs for what your strategy should be, which is those bigger choices that guide other choices, is to talk to your customers and to gain customer insights. So today we're going to talk about uh, a variety of different ways to do that, benefits of each kind, et cetera. But let's just talk about me for a second. Hi, I'm Tammy. Uh, I currently live in Miami, where I grew up. I have lived in Los Angeles and New York City. Uh, where I got to be friends with Ellen. I love to travel. I cannot wait for all the travel bans to be gone. But when it comes to my professional world, I am a B2B SaaS person. I've worked at companies like Cornerstone On Demand. I was employee 120 there. Uh, I was there when they went public. Uh, and then sometime after that, I've also, as Ellen mentioned, be part of, uh, been part of JustWorks if some of you are New York-based companies or just using JustWorks for your payroll benefits. Uh, so I'll actually get, tell a story or two about that. Uh, and then most recently, I worked uh, with uh, Melissa Perry through Products Labs as the CPO in residence for Insight Partners, working with growth stage and scale ups um, on their product strategies for growth, et cetera. And believe it or not, when I work with early stage founders or staff as such as yourselves, the same sort of questions around customer insights happen that happen at the growth stage and scale up that people somehow forget about how do they talk to their customers? How do they leverage that? And I think the earlier you can set up customer insights programs, the better you will be knowing what you should be doing next. And to me, product and strategy are all about making choices about what to do next. So um, let's, go over the agenda for today. So first we're gonna talk about why are customer insights valuable? So I've already started touching on that a little bit, if you noticed. Next, we're gonna get into who should you collect intel from? So when we say customer insights, is that only customers or are there more people? Uh, then we're gonna talk about how you can gather data specifically on customers. So data, a lot of people wanna be data driven and in earlier stage startups, there's less data to gather, but that doesn't mean that there's no data to gather. And then how do you make sure that whatever you're learning about your customer insights is something that's spread throughout your company so that it impacts their decisions in the same way we talked about strategy a minute ago. So why are customer insights valuable? I'm gonna start with a question. So who needs customer insights? And the question for you is, 
how do you currently make decisions? So if you wouldn't mind, use the chat function and uh, change it so that it says panelists and attendees. And tell me how you and your organization choose to do anything. Like, how do you make a decision? I'm gonna play Jeopardy music. Do, do, do. Intuition. Do, 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 do. Maybe we're not a very interactive bunch. I'll give answers, but I was hoping someone else would. All right, that's okay. Uh, we have one person who, oh, there we go. Qualitative feedback, data. We have our data help, our data lover here, Juliana. Starting at Heap. Yeah, Heap is definitely an option. Customer feedback, yeah. More customer feedback love. So, I mean, it seems like I'm preaching to the choir right now, which is great. <laughs> So, uh, but intuition does come into play. So often executive teams work on consensus. They have discussions and they get agreement. Uh, sometimes there's the highest paid person in the room that's making decisions. I'm sure that's never happened at any company you've worked at, uh, but it's definitely happened to me. So I just have to call it out there. <laughs> um, sometimes it's top down decisions, right? The executive team makes a decision, everyone else follows in line. Other times it's bottom up. The, the everyday employees who are interacting with the customers uh, make decisions and then the executive team uh, goes along with things. Um, but as Ellen mentioned, um, very often it's intuition. And to a certain degree, entrepreneurship is about trusting your gut. You wouldn't be where you are right now if you didn't have a hunch that there was a business opportunity. You got into this business because you said, I think there's an opportunity. I see a problem out there and I know I can fix it. So you trusted your gut about that, which was great. Um, and you probably trusted your gut about what the solution should be, uh, et cetera. Though I know a number of people here said customer feedback because they were trying to kiss up the teacher. Um, but I, I believe you that you actually believe it also. Um, but still, we, we trust our gut all the time because we have to, because we're, in a world of limited information. Uh, product management is not a perfect science. Strategy is not a perfect science. Corporate development is not a perfect science. You have to say there's this balance between trusting your gut and data because you don't always have the data. Um, and very rarely do we have fully complete data that makes it 100% clear that we should do anything, which is where our gut comes in. But what allowed you to be an entrepreneur and start a company which was trusting your gut that there was this thing out there that needed to be solved. At, over time, you have access to more and more data, at which point trusting your gut becomes less of what you do. And so that's part of maturing as a company. And then another question for you is how do you trust other people? Um, you may or may not be a company that Bold Start invested in, you may have other investors, you may have other advisors outside of your investors. How do you know they're correct? And customer insights also help counterbalance that. So if you go to a board meeting and one of your board members says, blah, 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 this is the right path. I know best, I have this experience. That's lovely, but chances are you know a little bit more about your customer base. And if you could then bring them back and show them the customer insights that you generated, they may realize they have a little bit to learn from you. So, or you might validate what their opinion was, but um, humans are fallible. And so knowing that you have to validate whatever advice you're being given is where customer insights can also come in. And my last question is, do you have customers, <laughs> right? So if you have customers, let them help you choose your direction. There are so many options out there as to a direction to choose, a strategy to choose. Let them help you, right? Talk to them. Why not talk to them about what they need, what they want? They're the ones who you're serving. It's, it's the most simple question. And so let's get into who you should talk to now that we've agreed that customer development is important. Um, option one, everyone. Talk to everyone, whether that's all your customers, the entire world, et cetera. Just go on a massive listening tour, have fun. 
your internal team members. So especially in the B2B space, you have a lot of proxies for customers. Your customer support team, your customer success team, your account management team, your sales team, your inside sales team, your outside sales team, et cetera. The executive team, the uh, people who are dealing with the really big escalations, um, et cetera. So all of those people can work as proxies for your customers. So that's an alternative instead of talking directly to customers. You could talk to your happy customers. So people who answer your net promoter score with nines and tens, they love you. They've been sending you referrals. Awesome, talk to those people. You can also talk to your former customers, the people who are a little bit less happy with you. So a lot of people forget to talk to this group because they just want to add value to the people who are their customers. But you should also talk to former customers to learn why do they leave? How were their expectations mismanaged? Why didn't they realize the maximum value out of the product that you offered them and they signed up for? It? And so put that on your list if it's not already on your list. And it doesn't need to be that you talk to them immediately as they leave. It may be something you do a few months down the road and you ask them, who are they using now? Why is it better, right? In the product world, we talk about something called jobs to be done and that your product is actually being hired for a job. And so if someone leaves your, your customer base, chances are they're gonna hire some other product for that job. So you need to find out why they liked it more. How, is it serving them better, et cetera. And so that's an, another opportunity. Um, option five, this new group of things, lost leads and prospects. A lot of people forget that the people who were part of their funnel and left have valuable information about why they left. In the same way, an actual customer who crossed over the bridge and said, I want to give you money, um, might choose to say, I'm not getting the value I want, so I'm leaving. In the same way, your leads and your prospects, they're being pitched your services and they haven't been convinced to take that next step. And so you need to find out are they not being convinced because you're not marketing it well? Or are they not being convinced because the product doesn't serve their needs? And you have to evaluate if the product doesn't serve their needs, are they your target customer anyways? Should you care, right? Lots of leads and prospects will leave because they showed up at your website by accident. They misunderstood what you did, et cetera. Don't worry about those people. But if there are people within the lead and prospect group that have left or are really holding back and not moving forward in the stage gates you've established through your sales funnel and they're your part of your ideal customer base figure out why that is by having a conversation with them that isn't necessarily done by your salesperson it might be done by an executive it might be done by a product person it might be done by a customer success person so they don't feel like they're being sold to but you say, hey, we're doing some research, market research. We want to talk to you about how you evaluate our types of services, et cetera. And there will be people who are willing to talk to you. And it is good insight, both for the marketing team, the sales team, and the product team. So what is the answer? All of them. All of the groups you just talked to are people you should talk to. Aside from the everyone. Don't go on a listening tour of everyone. That is a bad idea but you can still talk to people who aren't in your ideal customer profile, et cetera, because they're your next group of customers. So, so sometimes you wanna to talk to people in other verticals or in other industries to learn more about whether or not there's applicable opportunities for your product in those groups, but that's more where first concentrate on the people you wanna serve. And so what you wanna do is select groups of individuals from each of those options of the happy customers, the unhappy customers, the leads and prospects who left, et cetera, and target them with very specific uh, questions and methodologies for gaining uh, customer insights. So you wanna make sure that as you reach out to them, you're efficient and effective. You don't wanna do the exact same thing with each of them. And so we're gonna go through in a second, different ways of collecting data on these groups of people. 
Um, but it is important that you don't have to talk to all of your happy customers. You want to select groups and you're going to do that through customer segmentation or otherwise to guide your decisions about who is good for you to talk to. And I'll give you some best practices in just a second. So how can you gather data on customers? I've hopefully convinced you by now that there's lots of different groups that you can be talking to. And as we've mentioned, they aren't necessarily customers. They're just customer insights. So it's insights into your current customers as well as potential customers that are out there. So we're going to go through seven different methods for gathering customer insights, getting into their brain, being empathetic, et cetera. So first up, we're going to talk about customer interviews, which is very often what people think about. Um, and then we'll talk about customer surveys. One of those two things is probably what you thought about when you think about customer development. We'll also talk about customer visits, which is a more sophisticated version of an interview, but it's in person. Um, if any of you have customer advisory boards or you're thinking about creating a cab, we're going to go through that. Um, you can notice that all, all of those said customers. Then we'll talk about actual data collection and different sources for data. Um, exit surveys. So these are helpful when you're losing a customer um, or losing a prospect. And then exit interviews, which is a more in-depth version of that. So let's kick this off with customer interviews. Oh, sorry. We have one more topic. Churn automation. This is something that I advocated a lot for during COVID. And so I consider this part of gathering customer insights, and I'll explain to you why in a minute. So first up, customer interviews, sitting down with a customer to talk to them, learn about them. You might show them paper prototypes. You might do this over Zoom. It can totally be done virtually. Um, but what you want to be doing is thinking about your current customers and looking at the data about their usage and segmenting them so that you know who you want to be talking to, whether that's super users or your users that are still within their first 90 days or very experienced users, admins, et cetera. But think about some sort of segment, different usage level and talking to them. Um, the benefit of talking to them is you can get in-depth responses. You have the opportunity to dig deeper, right? Because you're having a conversation. So you can say, what did you mean by that? Or can you tell me more about that? Um, Etc. And so the best practices for customer interviews starts with open ended questions. So even the two questions I just asked, only one of them was open ended. So can you tell me more about that is technically a yes, no. Um, but tell me what you meant about that. Tell me about your day. Describe to me what an ideal thing looks like. Those sorts of questions end up getting a lot more information than questions that are considered closed, which means they can be answered with a yes or a no. Do you like this? Yes. Why? Right? So instead of going through that process, you can say, what do you like about this screen? Or what do you like about the experience? Or what do you dislike about the experience? And so open-ended questions is so core to quality customer interviewing. And I'm sure I'm not the first person to say that to any of you. The next thing is scenarios. So posing to the customer you're talking to a real world scenario and saying, if you were in a situation where X was going on, what would you do? So again, it's an open-ended question, but you're helping them get into a mindset around what it is you are building, right? The moment of when they might hire your product to do something. And so creating a few scenarios where you can ask them to put on their thinking cap and imagine where they might be will help you get, again, more insights. There is a big pitfall out there, especially in B2B companies, um, when it comes to conducting customer interviews. And that is, there's a stage gate called your account management team or your customer success team or whoever it is that owns the relationship with those current customers. And they can be very protective because they're incentivized that the customer should stay and they're afraid that if product or another person starts poking at them and saying, what don't you like about the product, that they might leave. And so getting into a good corporate level initiative that customer interviews are valuable helps the account management team, first of all, step aside and say, okay, we have to do this. Um, but also we're collaborating in a partnership with the account management team so that they 
feel more comfortable with you asking these questions of their customers that they value so much. And so just be aware of that because they're incentivized to protect customers in, in all sorts of ways. Um, and Atlassian, which owns Jira, does a really good job of customer interviews and they have a whole big program to do this. And um, it allows um, for them to really have lots of insights. One of the things they actually gained through their insights of customer interviews is that they could raise their prices. How awesome is that? That they learn from their customers that their customers were willing to pay them more for more enterprise features. And it, it, it's, it's an amazing thing to, to say, okay, we're gonna just up all of our prices because our customers are okay with that. Imagine that kind of insight. So someone has asked a question, they're anonymous in the Q and A, and I'm gonna answer it. How do you engage a diverse group of customers to partake in interviews? I always struggle to find customers I don't have a relationship with to partake in interviews. I try incentives with Amazon gift cards, but I always have the same 10 clients who are willing to get on the phone. And so um, I've had that experience as well. Um, and to a certain degree, those 10 clients, maybe they are, should be part of your customer advisory board. But this gets back to that partnership with account management or customer support in that if they understand that this is a valuable thing to the entire company, they should be helping surface more customers for you to outreach to. That when they get off the phone with certain customers, they should say, I really want to introduce you to our product team. I think you're a super user. I think you've got really great insights about what the market needs, what other people like you in the similar position need. Would you mind spending 15, 20 minutes with our product team? They really want to pick your brain. So the more they can build it up as a positive thing, the less you'll have to offer an Amazon gift card. But um, so it has to be the people who are closer to the customers that are helping you find people to talk to. Um, because sending out an email to all the customers offering a $20 Amazon gift card isn't necessarily going to work as you've noted. You may also wanna switch up your incentive, right? Run an experiment. What happens if what they get instead of an Amazon gift card is an opportunity to be part of an executive round table with your chief whatever officer who's going to talk with them and learn with them uh, and they can share insights of best practices in whatever industry it is you serve. Maybe that's a different kind of incentive that, that might work better. I don't know, but playing around with what that incentive is um, because Amazon gift card, I love Amazon, but I'm not always, my billable rate's a lot higher than the $15 or $20 Amazon gift card I'm going to get for spending a half an hour with you. So thinking about that, thinking about the kinds of people you're talking to, especially if they're executives, 15, 20, a hundred dollars on Amazon isn't going to convince them to show up to a customer interview, right? You're selling to businesses very often and therefore time is money and they're working hard and you have to figure out what's going to be exciting for them as the incentive. So those are my two pieces of advice please, please, please try them both and send me a note about how they worked. Um, and if anybody else has other pieces of advice for anonymous intent you want, please put them into the chat. Things that you found successful. We're, we're a community here and I, um, I should not be the only one whose opinions uh, get shared. Uh, next up, customer surveys. So um, come in, send out a survey, get some answers. Your target group can be any segment of your customers. Uh, the benefits is that it's time efficient. Best practices are that similar to the interviews, you're using rating scales, net promoter score, multiple choice with ranges. So it's not just like yes, no questions all the time, as well as some open-ended questions. Um, the pitfalls are there's always a bias for who responds. But um, I think actually Grubhub and Seamless do a good job of this. Every time I order, they ask me how it went and they ask me how the food was and things like that. I don't always go through the whole survey, but they, they learn more about their customer base and the, the marketplace that they're part of. Um, next up, customer visits. So the difference between a customer interview and a customer visit is that customer visit, you go to them. Very important, you go to them. And when you go to them, um, again, choose a specific segment of some new feature set you're planning on serving. 
The benefit is that you see their habitat, which understandable in COVID times is very weird, but I'm still telling you about this because go see them at work once they go back to their desk. And when you see someone in their habitat, it surfaces so many unspoken details, things they would never mention to you, that they're actually in a cubicle next to somebody else who's a loud chewer, or that their slack is always up. Um, when I was at Pivotal Labs, as Ellen mentioned, uh, one of our clients was MLB Advanced Media. They're the people who do MLB.com, and at some point they had a partnership with HPO. Um, and we were building a customer service tool for the people who, when you call and said something, I can't log in, they would talk to you. And so we did virtual um, visits with this group in the Philippines and they shared their screen with us and we got to see them answer a few calls. And what we learned was that they all had these little, like little sticky notes open and they would like type things into the sticky note because pasting it into the, and then they would paste it into the Oracle system they were currently using. And when we said to MLB that we had been doing that, they were incredibly surprised. They said, what do you mean you talked to our customer service people? And we said, well, we wanted to know how they were using the current tools. So we watched them. And they were like, but how did you do that? And then like, we scheduled a Zoom session. And they said, but how did you schedule a call with them? And we said, well, we talked to their managers and we said, are there people who'd be willing to let us uh, shadow for an hour? And they said, amazing. And it's amazing to me how often people just forget to talk um, and ask for permission to talk um, to their customers. Like you have a list of your customers, reach out to them, figure out who's willing to talk. Um, and so in-person is obviously best for customer visits, but virtual if, it, if expense of travel and scheduling just gets to be too hard because we all weren't going to the Philippines as much as I wanted to. Next up is a customer advisory board. Setting up a customer advisory board is something that companies often don't do until there's a significant number of customers, but it doesn't have to be that way. You could have a small customer advisory board and grow it over time. And so the people who are on the customer advisory board should be high value customers generally, because you care about their opinions and you care about getting more of them. So you want to figure out how these group, this group of high value customers, you can replicate. So you want to get as many insights from them as possible. Some of the benefits are they become better advocates of your product. They learn, you're going to show them things that are coming new. They're going to go to a conference and talk, talk about it. They're going to meet their friend who used to work with them and is now a director at some other company. And they become more invested in your mission because they feel like they're part of the team. Uh, best practice of this is making it a regular meeting. Um, quarterly is great. If it's semi-annual, that's also fine. I don't like the annual customer advisory boards because you just try to fit too much in. So really try to make it quarterly and have your executives there. You're probably inviting executives or at least director level people, decision makers from your customers, and they will feel more valued in the time that they're giving you if your executives are there to listen as well. I'm not saying your CEO has to be in the room, but people with VP level titles, get one or two of them in the room and you'll see how many more, how much more engaging the customer advisory board can be. They're not supposed to talk very much, but they're supposed to be there to listen. Um, and then pitfalls come back to like not having enough diversity, whether it's you only choose customers of a certain uh, vertical or otherwise. So just think through who do you want to get insights from in an ongoing advisory way and making sure that there's a little bit more diversity than just a very small segment. Next up, data collection. This is a sales dashboard, nothing special here, um, but you have lots of data, believe it or not, um, on your leads, on your prospects, and even probably on your customers. Someone mentioned Heap, which is a great tool for gathering data on customer usage patterns. Uh, there's lots of other tools out there, Pendo, Intercom, uh, Gainsight. Uh, there's dozens and dozens, just simple Google Analytics also. Um, and the benefit of it is that it's the most objective. So it is always going to be the most objective to looking at data. There's no recency bias, meaning that unlike when you ask a customer service person a question about like, what's the biggest problem right now, there's no chance that the data is going to tell you that the biggest problem over the last three months was the last phone call they got off of, 
but there is a chance the customer service person might do that. And so what we call recency bias is what people remember because it just happened doesn't exist in data. So thumbs up to data. And so best practices are to collect important data. Don't collect all the data. Keep is a kind of all the data thing. And then you filter out what's important. And that's totally great for when you're getting started. But make sure that you're filtering for what's important. Uh, think about steps that individuals are taking. Onboarding, first experience, next experience. How is it that they're generating a report, et cetera, and seeing the conversion rates between those steps. I used to own the self-service process at JustWorks. So there were lots of steps about getting your benefits quote and uh, applying for workers comp, seeing the pricing, et cetera. And so knowing what the general order of things is and where the conversion rates are, you want to set target goals against your data for any sort of experiment you're running. Because very often, even if you've done customer interviews, surveys, visits, et cetera, when the rubber hits the road and you actually release something, the data may not agree with what you thought it was going to be. So be sure to set a target goal and make sure that once that's in place, you actually monitor it after launch. Can't tell you how often that happens. People just forget to monitor. And that what you're monitoring are what we would call actionable metrics. So they help you with that direction. They tend to be ratios and not counts, and they tend to be important ratios. So one of the experiences I had at JustWorks was that we looked at the conversion of a page after we added some logos on it, and the conversion of the page actually went down. We thought, oh, wow, maybe we were wrong about this decision. We talked to customers, et cetera, before we rolled it out. But then we learned that the actual number that we cared about, the conversion number was them becoming customers. It was the whole funnel. And it turned out that if they saw that logo earlier, there was more probability that they converted down the line. And to a certain degree, if they saw the logo and didn't like it, they were filtering themselves out of the process earlier on, which meant we could give better uh, service to those who actually went through. Um, question, how do you best reach out to customers and when you see them using when uh, when you see them using the product incorrectly, I'm not trying to make it look like I'm stalking them. This is coming from viewing trends with Pendo. Yeah. So when you're looking at data, so Pendo is one of those tools. You look through user flows, and you're like, why does this person keep exporting and then converting the report? There's a button that they could be using instead. And so um, you don't want to call up a customer and tell them they're using it wrong. You want to call a customer and say, hey, I want to understand how it is you use our tools. Can you walk me through this scenario and et cetera? And then you can say, um, are you aware of this feature, right? <laughs> Which I know is not an open-ended question, but you can ask that question and say, are you aware of this feature? We rolled it out X amount of time ago. You might have missed the release notes on it. And then you'll find out that they either say yes, or no, right? And they say, yes, I tried it, but I couldn't use it because of X, right? That there's some flaw in what you think is a great feature that doesn't work for them. Or no, I didn't know about that. Um, what ha and then you can say, well, what do you expect to happen when you click that button? And then they'll explain that to you. And you'll say, okay, great. Like, let's play with that button and see what happens. Um, and so that gives you the customer insight as to why someone isn't using your tool correctly. Um, but also it's possible that their incorrect usage is a new market opportunity. That their incorrect usage is actually something you could do with it. So uh, Zendesk, which I think we all know does customer support software, recently um, started like selling to sales teams because they realized that they could actually compete with companies like Salesloft for email marketing and cadences and, and preformed text. And they already had relationships inside some of the biggest corporations of the world. And they could probably say, hey, can you introduce me to the sales leader? Because we've got tools that they can use. And most of it isn't a matter of building something new. It's just a little bit like reskinning and changing the words. So that's a spectacular opportunity. And I, I don't know for sure, but I assume that that came through some customer interviews or even some customers signing up to use it for their sales team. The reason why I um, mentioned Salesloft here is that they're, they're an inside company and I worked with them on creating what we call their product operations baseline. 
And they were fantastic to work with because they had done so much investment in making sure all of their data sources were integrated and set up correctly to surface these sorts of insights. So um, it does involve an investment. Uh, JustWorks made a similar investment to something they called D House for their data warehouse, which allowed for anybody to run SQL reports and eventually they put Tableau on top of it. But um, the sooner you can make sure that your Pardot or your Marketo and your Salesforce and your internal data sources like Pendo, et cetera, are being brought together in a way that you can see the full picture of your customers, the better your strategic decisions will make. And SalesLoft was like ready to hit the road. And we were, we were really uh, excited to work with them. Um, next up, exit surveys. So um, why are you leaving? And so these could be for uh, customers that are leaving or prospects that are leaving. Um, we've all seen some sort of exit survey at some point. Just works like many of the rest of you uses it for prospects that leave the funnel as well as customers. Um, and they're great for anybody who's leaving. But the reason why they're great is because they're time efficient and they also allow for data collection, right? So you're going to have masses of them that you couldn't get through our next method, which is exit interviews. Um, but some best practices are um, randomizing your answers because unfortunately one of the pitfalls of surveys is especially for exit when people are just, if they're even gonna answer the exit survey, they just choose the first one. And so that sucks. But if you have randomized answers that might surface, um, you also wanna offer them an option to have a call. So that's a good way to generate a group of people who are willing to have an exit interview with you um, because they feel impassioned. They really believed in what you could have been for them and are upset because you're not. Um, but the other pitfall is when other is an option and you don't require someone to type something in. And even when you do, people are going to choose it because um, the answers aren't that aren't uh, applicable to them. So if you're seeing a lot of others, it means you don't have the right answers out there. Conduct some exit interviews to find out what kind of answers should be there and then update your survey because you want to be able to gather information. And um, if someone says the price is too high again and again and again, that's good data, but you want to better understand is the price actually too high or are they just not seeing enough value for the price? And so things like that um, are the ways to start manipulating exit surveys so they can be more effective for you for customer insights. Next up, as I mentioned, exit interviews, because it turns out unhappy customers are some of your greatest sources of learning. And so target groups, lost prospects or the obvious churning customers, having that time where you're saying, we're gonna bring in our top people to listen to you, not just the, whoever it is that's like canceling them, but like, hey, we'd like to schedule some time with head of customer support, head of customer success, a uh, product manager, et cetera, so that we can best understand where it is that we didn't do enough. So it comes with a little bit of humility, um, but it, it makes them feel generally better. Um, and so you, you have the opportunity to surface these missed opportunities that you could have had to serve your customers. Again, this comes back to the ideal customer profile. So if someone's churning either involuntarily, meaning their business went out of business, don't worry about it, or because it turns out they bought you and they shouldn't have, right? There's, there's some tool that's better for their industry or otherwise. Um, that's okay. You might not want to invest the time in the exit interview, but if you think a customer that fits your ideal customer profile is leaving, you want to know why, right? You want to know what your competitors are doing that are out, that are outshining you, whatever it is. And so your best practices for doing this is making sure that everybody knows how to do this. Your sales team, your customer support or success team, your account management team knows how to do this and knows how to dig deep by asking those open-ended questions, by incentivizing them to have a conversation, because you want to make sure that you have a variety of people that are always ready to capture this information and surface it to the product team or the other executive leadership team so that strategic decisions can be made so that it happens less often. Um, pitfalls with this stuff is it involves a whole bunch of tagging. Like there's a lot of busy work to get it right. 
Um, and unfortunately, someone's going to have to have another angry conversation with someone who's leaving, which is not very fun, but often worthwhile. And so the reason why I mentioned HubSpot here is they have something called a Chi score for each of their customers, their customer happiness index. Um, and everybody who talks to a customer knows how to tag whatever they think the most recent customer happiness index is. And that's a matter of the entire organization being incredibly customer centric. And so it's something to think about of how can you create a culture where everyone knows they are there to serve the customers and have them maximize the value they're realizing from your product. All right, last up, doesn't seem like a customer insights program, but churn automation. So churn automation, this is Audible's churn automation. And this is literally what happens when you try to cancel Audible, but it happens like 10 times. Um, if anybody wants to put in the chat that they similarly have tried to cancel Audible and had like 18 screens they had to go through, I think Audible does a fantastic job of churn automation. They keep offering you something else and something else that makes it cheaper, that gives you more books. It, it's amazing the offers you can get if you say no like 10 times. Um, so churn automation is when on screen you have the ability to cancel, which I know in B2B software is not that common, but occasionally it's there. And I'll give you a B2B example in just a second. It's the screens that someone goes through while they are canceling, which helps um, you potentially capture them back, right? And so the way it works is that you want only your, to a certain degree, low value churning customers going through this because you want your high value customers going through an exit interview where you might actually really get to capture them back. But it's a very low cost way to save some of your customers from churning. Um, best practices are don't only have it be one offer, actually give them like two or three offers, which I know seems annoying when canceling, but it's your, your job isn't to not be annoying right now. Your job is to save as many people from churning as you can. Um, and the next thing is make sure that whatever you're offering them is actually enticing. And it doesn't have to be about price. It might be about additional services you're offering. It might be about having them be in the premium tier for six months um, at the basic tier price. There are options for what you can put together as an offer. Um, you wanna be careful uh, in the pitfall world that your offer isn't so good that people are gonna try to cancel just for fun so they have lower pricing. Um, and you also probably don't wanna show this to everybody who's churning because if somebody is already a high touch client and they've called up their account manager and they're churning, you don't necessarily want them to have to click this 17 times because they will get annoyed with you and they will tell others that you are annoying. But B2B company um, slash B2C, because Calendly definitely has a lot of B2C, but they're shifting towards B2B uh, is Calendly, right? So this is a SaaS business tool. It's one of my favorite tools that are out there. But if you try to cancel or downgrade, they will give you an offer as to how to keep you at the level you want. And they will tell you about the benefits of that level and why you should stay. And so the reason why I think of this as a customer insights opportunity is that similar to a marketing landing page, the messaging you're putting out there, the offer you're putting out there is something you can experiment with, right? So when I give you two different offers in two different languages, not languages, but verbiage, um, what does that, if one converts better, maybe that means that we need to make sure that feature is actually on the premium level. Um, or if there's something about lowering the price that really helps people stay, maybe I should just have lowered prices at that lower tier to begin with. And so looking through the data around churn automation can really allow you to surface customer insights. It also allows you to be more efficient when dealing with churn, which is why we suggested it to a number of companies during COVID because it allowed for them to focus on the customers they really wanted to keep and leave the low value churning customers to an automated robot that they might capture some of, but it wasn't nearly as important as investing the, the time and effort into keeping their high value customers. All right, before we get to this, there is a question. Um, I've had this with Audible. I still don't know if I actually canceled. 
<laughs> Natalie, I totally understand. <laughs> I have had that moment <laughs> where I'm just not sure if I actually canceled. All right, so now that we have seven different or eight different, eight different ways that you can capture um, customer insights, I should probably change the title on that slide to eight. Um, how can you spread your knowledge? So how can you as an organization leverage what you've just learned for customer insights and share them? So um, I'm gonna try this again. Now that you've been hearing me talk for a while, uh, please put into the chat, who has Intel on customers? You all really don't like to use the chat. All right. Oh, look, the success teams. Yes, everyone, customers themselves, researchers, customer service, sales, account managers, and the CX team, 100%. Those are great answers. Thank you for putting in things into the chat. I like it when things are more interactive. Um, so customer service, as a number of you mentioned, um, or CX, account management. Uh, the marketing team. Marketing team, because they're running all of these landing pages and ads, also has insights into what is resonating with customers of different segments, et cetera. And they actually have probably very good segmentation information. Your inbound sales team. So the people who pick up the phone for your 1-800 number have an understanding of the kinds of customers that do that and what kind of questions come up. Um, your outbound sales team. So your more sophisticated actual closers, not just the people who answer, um, have information about what kind of questions come out during a demo, right? What do they demo? What do they not demo? How does that uh, help conversion? What do they put into their emails that are in sales loft or whatever they're using for automated email outreach that they find resonates with customers or not? Uh, and so there is insights there that your sales team knows that if you don't talk to them, you will miss because they are talking to prospects all day long and they are incentivized for the prospect to say yes. You may also service that they're lying about your product. Just throwing it out there. It's happened. Maybe not at your company, but it's happened at companies I work for where the sales team is, you know, pitching things that don't exist. Um, so it's also good to service that. But that is also an opportunity for product to say, oh, well, maybe we should build that because the sales team says this helps them get responses. So it, it's good to know about. Um, next up, sales management. So very often sales teams have their own quarterly business reviews or otherwise, and they're surfaced up to the sales team leads, talk to the sales team leads about the trends that they're seeing as opposed to an individual sales person, recency bias, individual bias, et cetera. Um, get solved with that a little bit. Your product management team hopefully has intel on customers. Um, and so those are the different groups. But the big question about them is, are they sharing what they know? So whether it's a QBR or something else, are they saying, oh, we're only going to keep this information in the customer service team? Oh, we're only going to keep this information in the marketing team? Oh, we're only going to keep this information in the sales team? Oh, we're only going to keep this information in the product team? That doesn't help anybody. Like lack of collaboration and sharing with data doesn't help anybody. So what I want you to think about is the process for customer insight synthesis. And the most important part of the process to me isn't gathering those observations, which we've talked about, and it isn't summarizing those. It's a matter of sharing it. So sharing what you've learned in those customer insights with the executive team, with different teams, with different parts of the organization, um, put it in writing, put it in a deck, record a session such as like we're doing right now so that other people can see it. Um, and if there's something sensitive that you're covering that's like very hush hush, have it be in a, in a meeting. It doesn't need to be put in writing, but the more you can put in writing, the more you will have the opportunity for people who get onboarded after said presentation to learn about things where um, the sales enablement team might be able to use it, the product management team might be able to use it, customer service might be able to use it, and it, take whatever you put out there as a customer insight and share it um, with their own teams as part of training. So here are some opportunities for when you can do that. You have all hands presentations, that can be part of it. 
you have QBRs, you have leadership team meetings where you, where one person marketing sales, CS product, et cetera, can share what they have from customer insights with the other leadership. And then they can then trickle them down to their team. You can have an internal wiki or confluence where people are putting this sort of information in. You can have an internal blog or newsletter. So a uh, greenhouse, the applicant tracking system actually does this. Um, and it's one of the most important things that they have internally as a form of communication about product releases, but they also include customer insights in it. Um, there's a consulting term called information radiators, uh, which is pretty much just means a sign. But if you've ever seen an office with those televisions and data dashboards on them, that's an information radiator. You might have your North Star metrics on that. Um, at JustWorks, we had at the customer service center, nice little quote boards of different things customers had said in a positive way. There might be a Slack channel that's all about positive things customers wrote in. So these are different information radiators because they radiate information across the organization. Um, and so those help people get insights. And the last one is data dashboards and making sure that they're shareable. So whatever you're using as your data dashboard space, to, to make those things shareable. And now we've got around 10 minutes for questions other than the ones we've already answered. So um, I'm gonna check chat. Uh, the product manager, yes, I agree with you about product. So that was on the list. Um, who has a question that they haven't already asked? I know Natalie has a couple that people in the portfolio specifically asked her to get to, uh, but I'm just still loving this information radiator thing. I think that is great. <laughs> I mean, you can use information radiators for anything. Like it could be the product roadmap that you're putting up there, but I loved the like little note cards of what customers had said that were positive. Um, you could probably have one for like unhappy customers too, uh, though that might be a little bit less inspirational, but um, things like that. Yeah, like empathy maps that are up there. So if you're unfamiliar with empathy maps, they're a way of, um, articulating how a customer is thinking, feeling like what are they exposed to, seeing, etc. And so you can put that up. You can put up your user personas or your buyer personas, which are your stereotypical customers that you're trying to serve. And that way, um, different people can use that information. Um, okay. Question where Natalie is representing a portco. Um, sometimes I hear lots of different things from customers. Once I have all this data, how do I decide who to really listen to? So the first thing you wanna do, um, and I'm gonna go back a slide or two, is um, make sure, so you've done the gathering. This is what Natalie's talking about. You've done the gathering. Uh, you wanna make sure you have something that allows you to summarize it. So you wanna be looking for trends. You wanna, once you find those trends, think about customer segments, right? So where are their trends within your customer segments, whether that customer segment is based on customer size, customer usage patterns, geography, um, vertical. Um, there's so many different customer segments you can think of that, um, but you wanna group by them and then see, are there trends within those groups? And then you wanna remember that you have an ideal customer that you wanna serve. Strategically, you've chosen a particular size, geography, vertical, et cetera, that is your ideal customer. And so you wanna look at those first because they're higher value. Then you wanna look at the next group, which is what's the next market you wanna be attacking. So who is your next, your future ideal customer who may be larger or more international or broader, or a new vertical, et cetera. Cause that guides you as to how you can improve things for the future for growth. Um, and then the other ones are less important to just be totally blanket. You want to read through them just in case there's some insights where you're like, oh, this helps me surface that there's actually this opportunity I didn't even know about. So similar to when someone's using the product incorrectly, maybe they're using it correctly, but for a use case you never thought of. Um, and so those would be the, the, the beginnings there. Hopefully that answered the person's question. And when they watch this video, they'll be super excited. <laughs> All right. Um, from Prakar, uh, our biggest challenge is how to best understand how to market our product to two specific personas. Currently, our product calls, um, we get multiple different personas, but we want the end users so that they have the, they use the product better and attain value. How can we best achieve this? 
Prakar, can you actually go on um, audio and explain this a little better? Because I'm happy to answer the question. I'm just a little bit lost. Hi, Tammy. Hi. Good. Um, so just a quick, quick question. So we have multiple users who join our calls, and I want to only focus on two specific subsets because they are the more front-end users. And without having management or other higher power users sort of obstruct that. Okay. Um, how do we best achieve that? Um, are you having group user calls and yes. like managers end up talking? Is this like with an individual client and then like all seven people from the client show up? Is that the idea? So picture like a, a health system. So like you have managers, nurses, supervisors, literally everybody on this call at the same time. Um, why are you not allowed to invite just the level of people you want to talk to? Um, the main issue is because they just are not tech savvy as much, the end but users. You want to talk to them, right? Correct. So I, I, I don't know why you can't just say, hey, we're going to have a special session with this group. And you can even call it a training session and then have yeah. it be a customer insight session. But I think that if, if you want the other people in the room to be quiet, the easiest way is to make sure they're not there or only one of them is there to oversee it or something else. Okay. And come up with a good framing for why you want to talk to that group. And so think about like what's in it for them, meaning like maybe pitching it as a training or something else, mm -hmm. uh, or you're doing research about a new tool you're thinking about building that's specially designed for them. Right. Even if that isn't really the case, um, it's more of a white lie. Cause if something like that did service, you'd probably build it. Um, but um, that's, that's what I would say is like, if you're, if there's too many people in the room, have mm -hmm. less people in the room. Okay. Yeah, good luck. Hopefully that's helpful. Thank you. Um, all right, from anonymous attendee. What do you do if a customer says, I'd buy it if you had X? How do you balance customer needs or feedback without becoming a feature factory? So this gets back to the strategy and those choices and those frameworks. So if X, fits into your strategy or framework, that makes sense. Um, and I'm actually gonna pull up a, I'm gonna stop sharing this. Look at that, Ellen. I, I, I taught you all about sharing multiple things before we started. And um, then I, uh, I'm gonna just actually do something different. Um, so I have this image. That's one of my favorite images I ever created. Um, and of course it's not gonna open, but open, 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 there we go. Um, close, share screen, open. So this is a graphic I made around the different sources for um, ideas for product development and what happens to them. So not everything makes it into the backlog. Sometimes things are not in line with a company vision. So that X, which can come from the customers, sometimes just really isn't where you want to serve. Sometimes one customer wants it, but when you test it with other customers, they don't find it valuable. Sometimes it's valuable, but right now you've made a strategic decision that you're focused on something and it's not part of what you're focusing on. Your strategic intents, your focus areas or otherwise. Sometimes you think it's valuable, it's been validated, it's totally what you want to be doing right now, but then you look at the development cost versus the ROI and it's not there. And so simply because a customer says something doesn't mean it doesn't have to go through stage gates to make it to the backlog. And so this gets back to you understanding, is that person part of your ideal customer? As well as, is this something that um, is right for you right now, right? So it isn't only about, um, is this um, a good idea, but is it the right idea for our company right now, which will help fuel growth? Simply because one customer surfaces it doesn't mean that it's the right opportunity for you. It might be a distraction. Any other questions in our you know, minute or so we have left? Uh, this is my information. Um, you can email me. You can set up a Calendly 15 minute call. I did mention I love them product. Um, I do coaching and advisory services for individuals, product teams and company leadership. Um, it could be as short as a one hour phone call or something that happens once a week or anything else. 
Um, and I love helping people think about their business with a product lens and how they can think about how do they engage customers and become more customer centric uh, in the way that they approach what they're building, what services they're offering, et cetera. And that's me. Nice to meet you. Thank you so much for joining us today, Tammy. I now know everyone will be getting many more surveys from me to give feedback on the Bold Start Speaker series. Uh, <laughs> so expect that. Or if you wish to talk to me, to have you get to pick a topic or pick a guest, I'm Ellen at Bold Start BC. I can also connect you with Tammy directly as well. Cool. Well, thank you all for joining and for participating. Um, I did appreciate those of you who had to enter into the chat or the Q&A. It always makes it more fun to me to know that I'm giving exactly the precise answers that you're looking for. Um, and thank you all for inviting me into your home slash offices today. Great. I will close this out now. Thank you so much all for joining. See you later, Tammy. Bye. Bye.